Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Giles Yeo, um, and um, I'm your host for, 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 for this evening. This is Eat for Your Future. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. Your climate diet questions answered. We'll, we'll get to what a climate diet is in, in, in a second. So um, I'm based here at the University of Cambridge, and um, I am a geneticist by trade, and I study the genetics of body weight, of which obesity is one end of the spectrum, and how our brain influences food intake. But I'm here uh, as an interested participant rather than as an expert, because I'm not. I'm an expert at eating food <clears throat> and studying how our brain controls food. So I'm here as a professional eater and a professional food intake studier. Um, so I just got to get, let's get through some, uh, <laughs> some housekeeping stuff and then we'll get the, we'll get the evening started. So uh, guys, this is a uh, Cambridge Zero Climate Change Festival event from the University of Cambridge. Hello, everybody. It has been organized by the Annual Food Agenda, part of EIT Food with Cambridge Sustainable Food and Cambridge Global Food Security. Um, it is also part of Cambridge Sustainable Foods Eat for Our Future campaign. Um, please do visit their website, cambridgesustainablefood.org, all small, uh, all small case, all one word, um, for lots of helpful advice on eating a more climate-friendly diet. And if you're in Cambridge, for loads of information about local groups and initiatives to help you and others eat more sustainably. Now, there's housekeeping. Um, a couple of things. Um, first of all, if there is a fire alarm, it is yours. You can you know where to leave. That's the first thing. A uh, second, please note that this event is being recorded. We'll let uh, attendees know where they can access the recording by email after um, after the event, and presumably um, as well as those registered but 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 not being here. Um, please, audience members, ensure your microphones and cameras are off and will remain so uh, throughout. Um, please, and this is meant to be interactive, so please do type your questions using the Q and A function. Um, at any time during the evening. Um, the chat and raise hand functions for you Zoom aficionados have been disabled. Um, so listen, the, the, tonight's program is very simple. I'm gonna introduce our esteemed panel um, and they'll have a, a, a couple of minutes just to set out their stall. Um, and then we go to the questions. I mean, uh, uh, prior to this, uh, prior to the attendees being here, we've already had more than 50 questions actually submitted. And so we've got a whole, we have a whole menagerie of questions that we can go to, but actually um, we'd also love to hear from, um, for, 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 from the audience here uh, alive. So if that's cool, um, let's, let's, get, um, let's get going. So I'm gonna intro, oh, I'm looking, I'm sure I'm looking through my script here, ladies and gentlemen, otherwise I get into trouble. I get told off for not look, for not sticking to the script. Um, I know some of you were looking forward to Alex Rushma of Vendelisle, um, uh, the Vendelisle restaurant, as well as uh, those of you who know counselor um, Alex Collis. Unfortunately, both have been unable to uh, make it, but we have an, a fantastic panel for you uh, nonetheless. So let me introduce our esteemed panel. Um, first, we have uh, Dr. Sarah Bridal, um, who is a transdisciplinary researcher driven by the need to tackle climate change. And her book, Food and Climate Change Without the Hot Air, I am full of hot air, incidentally, but there we go, was published in 2020 by UIT Cambridge. Sarah, very welcome to the uh, panel. Our next esteemed panelist is Anne Mitchell, who is director, who stood in, by the way, who, who stood in, in, in short notice. And so we all have to salute her and thank her for this. Um, is a director of Cambridge Sustainable Food, having been involved since its creation seven years ago. A, a retired primary school teacher, and she hopes to shape, to, she hopes to help shape a fairer, more sustainable, and less wasteful food system. Uh, then we have Dr. Emma Garnett, um, who is a Prince of Wales Junior Research Fellow in Sustainable Consumption at the Cambridge Institute for Sustainable Leadership, which is part of the University of Cambridge. Um, hello. Um, and uh, finally, last but not least, we have Dr. Jason O'Rourke. I'm sorry, I just murdered your name there, Jason. Um, Jason O'Rourke. He's uh, a head teacher at Washingborough Academy in Lincolnshire, co-founder co of Taste Ed Sensory Food Education and member of the All Parliamentary Group on School Food. So, guys... Let's hear your stall uh, um, before we get to the questions. Sarah, I introduce you first. Sarah, take it away. Give us your stall. Okay, so my stall. So I guess 
you want to know what I think is the, 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 the climate friendly diet and I'm going to uh, suitably dodge that question and say that my stall is that I want people to take uh, the climate impacts of food into account when choosing what to eat alongside all the other issues that you know we've got taste we've got convenience we've got cost um we've got health lots of different reasons why people eat food and so a climate friendly diet is going to look different for each person and i really want people to find it easy to take into account those climate impacts when they're making their decisions and i guess uh, one thing i'll put out there is to start with quantities and i can talk more about that if you're interested thank you so much sarah um, next up on the board, uh, Anne, set out your stall. Right. Um, I'm a director of Cambridge Sustainable Food. I've been with it right from its inception. We're part of the Sustainable Food Cities Network, which is a national network. And it looks at the whole food system um, because it's all interrelated. And the climate impact of our diet is as important as the health impact. Um, the impact of the local economy, um, food poverty. It's all part of a system and improving and getting that system working better for the health of everybody and for the health of the planet is, um, is really important. Thank you so much for that, Anne. Um, Emma, talk to us. Hello everyone. So what does a climate diet mean to you is the question. And I, I will go for this one. And I think that means a diet that's mostly plants or entirely plants uh, with small amounts of meat, fish and dairy. A climate diet also has got to be one that everyone can afford with very little food waste and more seasonal and local produce. So my research is around behaviour change and more sustainable diets. And the trouble is at the moment, unhealthy and unsustainable foods are very cheap, often very delicious and everywhere. So trying to eat a healthy climate diet can feel like you're swimming upstream rather than going with the flow. And so how can we make a mostly or entirely plant-based diet the most delicious, the most affordable, accessible and convenient option? And there's a number of different policies that could enable behavior change to more sustainable diets. We need to be looking at more veg and fewer meat options on menus, prominent position, positioning for healthy plant-based options. We could be looking at reducing portion and packaging sizes of ultra processed foods and uh, a lot of meat and dairy. We could be removing livestock subsidies and possibly using that money to reduce prices of healthy plant-based foods. So there's a lot of different things that uh, we could do and that is my store. Thank you so much, Emma. I, 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 I love it when we put you on your bully pulpit. Um, and, uh, um, and last but not least, Jason, give us your stall. Um, thanks, Giles. Yeah, as, uh, as Giles said, I'm, I'm an educator. Um, this is about eating for your future. Um, children are our future. And you can make a difference to what children are eating within the schooling system. Um, and we're showing that with what we've got here at, um, uh, at Washingborough. We have um, heritage orchards um, of local varieties of, of Lincolnshire apples. We have a 300 metre square um, organic vegetable plot that provides the food for the kitchen, our school kitchen. We have an apiary. We have um, plots for every class that are in the, the, the school. We have um, we just done a, an aeroponic system that we've got within the school as well. Um, so using harvest, harvesting rainwater for that. Um, the nudge thing that Emily was talking about as well, we have vegetarian options for our food um, um, every day. We put the vegetarian option at the top of the list. So people are looking at that first rather than having the meat option um, first, which is what we typically ha have in, in restaurants. Um, the key thing here, I think, is that food provides an educational value to so many areas. You can use it in a vast amount of um, educational areas. And what we want to do is get the joy, the curiosity, teaching children about their senses and, and engaging in food with that and you can change palates through that um, children are not a lot of children are not aware of what, where vegetables come from they haven't helped we've had children that haven't helped an onion they haven't smelt a ripe plum so we need to get the educational system focusing in on food as a learning tool um, that will support that sustainability future that those children are going to live thank you so much jason so 
actually, do you know what? Do you know what's interesting, um, guys? So this, in fact, I'm just calling it up so that I get 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 it right. This is why I'm kind of glazed over. So I saw this on the BBC News piece. Um, it says here about the economics editor just a 52 minutes ago. So you guys can actually and actually look climate plan urging plant based diet shift deleted. And so this is a situation in which there was um, some research that was done and put up. I think it was on the business page of the of of, of the government of the government site, uh, which which part in a there were a number of different um, things that were actually talked about there. But one of which suggested that maybe we needed to shift away from, not away completely, this is not asking everyone to be plant-based and vegan, but says we need to eat a little bit less meat. Oh my goodness, this probably came down quicker than you could say boo. Um, um, and then the government had to stand up and vociferously deny, you know, we are, we are not about trying to, to change people's behavior like this. And so it's very interesting. And I thought it was contemporaneous. It was just, just a couple of hours old, the news. And so I guess this leads to my first question, and I'm going to direct it at you, at you, Emma. So clearly, a couple of things. The government is terrified <laughs> to, to, to even suggest that we eat a little bit less meat. All right. But why don't I start with, let's start with the basics. Okay. Uh, and, and, that's, and wh why do you think um, that being vegetarian or vegan, or is there a difference, okay, is better for the environment? Right. So why, I'm going to say mostly plant-based diet, because a vegetarian diet could include vast quantities of cheese, which would not be so good for the climate or your health, but kind of a diet that is mostly plants. So why does meat and dairy and fish have these larger environmental impacts? And I think that's a really key question for us all to get on board. So this isn't what um, I think, this is what the evidence shows. And there's two principal reasons for this. One is that if you're feeding soy and grains and oils to pigs and chickens that you're then eating, that's not so efficient. So you're wasting um, energy and resource as you go up that uh, food chain that we learn about, many of us in GCSE biology. So that's you know, uh, a, a form of food waste. Um, and then the second reason why meat and dairy has uh, these larger environmental footprints is that cows and sheep although they could eat entirely grass, most of them have grains as well. So that's not eating food that we could eat, but that takes up a huge amount of land to produce quite a small amount of food. And that land could otherwise be storing a lot more carbon, supporting biodiversity. And then the final um, issue with cows and sheep is that because they're ruminants, they're pro uh, producing methane. And this is a very, very powerful greenhouse gas. It's short lived in the atmosphere. And that means that if we could reduce our methane emissions, we could actually get some cooling benefits quite quickly, whereas we have to wait longer for CO2. So those are the two principal reasons. And it's not saying that all plants um, you know, are equal. There's some that are better for the planet than others, of course. There is also a wide spectrum of different carbon footprints for different meats. Some meat is better than others, that is true. But generally, even the lowest carbon footprint meat and dairy foods tend to have higher carbon footprints than the worst plant-based sources of food. So it's really, really, really stark. You can go and read Sarah's excellent book to uh, see that in a lot of detail. So can can I let me let me interrupt just just well, interrupt I, the, 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 your your thought just just briefly incidentally uh, that was uh, that was just me just ruminating a question although I I was interested in it that was one of the questions that was pre submitted um, by um, um, and so so we're answering questions already we're we're good to go but but actually Emma as a follow up of a question so during lockdown certainly during the the, the most severe of the lockdown whatever eighteen months ago. I, I am uh, um, trying to eat less meat, but I love my meat. And so I, I found this um, ethical butcher and we can debate whether a butcher can ever be ethical, but I, I, this, this, is what, this is what I found. And they were then um, interested in speaking to me because, because, of, because of what I study about regenerative, regenerative meat. And so what, what is, can, can you, maybe you, Emma, or you, Sarah, I don't know. Someone explain to me, explain to the audience what regenerative meat is and is it, it, it can it ever be regenerative i guess i don't know uh, emma or sarah who, who would like to, to take that question if you know the answer sarah you you oh who, who wants to go first and both of you can can, can express an opinion uh <laughs> go on I'll, I'll, first. yeah <laughs> right okay I, I will go first so what is regenerative meat what is regenerative meat i'm not sure i don't i'm not sure if there's a good definition there's an interesting debate that we can send around afterwards sort of debating regenerative agriculture 
I imagine that fits into this idea that um, there's this phrase kind of less but better meat. And I think that doesn't really quantify things sufficiently. And I think if you're looking at better meat, that means much, much, much less. So there's that room. And I have a slightly kind of protracted metaphor, which is if you've got a bucket and you're trying to fit things into it, so some big rocks and some smaller pebbles and some sand, this is what we got taught how to time manage at school. I think the trouble is at the moment we're eating so much meat that we need um, the sort of factory farming and all the, the things that we instinctively don't like about meat. And so you've got this enormous meat taking up a huge amount of space in this bucket and there's no room for health or action on climate or biodiversity because the meat is crowding things out. So we've got to make sure we've got healthy diets, that we're living within kind of climate and ecological means and fitting all these big things into kind of the bucket. And then small amounts of meat can fit in the gaps in between. But we've got to get those things in place first and see where meat fits into those gaps rather than thinking, oh, well, because you can't have everyone. There is not enough land in the UK for everyone to be having, you know, nature friendly, grass fed, nature reserve beef. You need four times the amount of land in the UK just for current levels of meat consumption for that. So. so Yes. So Sarah, can, can, can I thank that? Was very informative. I now I now get 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 a better view. So Sarah, first of all, did you did you have any anything to add to the uh, to the vegan vegetarian question initially? Because I'm interested in your thoughts uh, about this uh, auto regenerative auto regenerative meat. Yeah, great. Uh, no, I mean, I agree with, with everything that Emma's saying. Um, it's, it's, you know, we're, we're just quoting from what the academic literature is, is the evidence is saying, as, as Emma said. Um, regarding a regenerative agriculture, um, I was going to say, yeah, everyone's talking about regenerative agriculture, but no one's really defined what it means. Um, so I agree totally with what Emma said, um, but it's really about putting back things back in rather than extracting things out all the time. So, for example, it's about uh, keeping more uh, carbon in the soil, having better soils rather than depleting the, the chemicals in the soils. And so it's, there's lots of great stuff there. Um, so, for example, you know, techniques like mob grazing, where you have, you know, um, sheep on a smaller area that then move onto another small area that allows the soil to recover between times. There's things like that which help the soil to restore more carbon and have more um, biodiversity in it. So there's lots of great stuff there. As to whether that's going to reduce the amount of methane that's um, produced by ruminants, that's not so clear. Um, so, you know, the things that Emma's been saying already about why um, animals contribute so much to climate change, you know, still stand. And certainly, you know, we're, we're talking about the same data here that that's, you know, m hundreds of research papers um, have, have shown these things that Emma's saying about the differences. So, for example, uh, some research actually shows that people often uh, correctly guess the, the, you know, which which things um, cause the most climate change, but they very much underestimate the size of this difference. So for example, if we were to look at say an eight ounce steak and chips, how different do you think that would be in terms of climate impacts compared to say a potato and beans dinner? Um, so, you know, people can try to guess that maybe in their heads, but most people are quite surprised to hear that if you take an, a European average eight ounce steak and chips, that's, a, that's about 20 times the climate impacts of having beans and potato for dinner, even if you take into account cooking and so on and transporting of all those the beans and potatoes. So, you know, the, and that's that's actually, you know, a factor of five bigger if you take uh, beef from a deforested region than from a European average beef. Uh, it can be lower if we if we use, um, you know, for example, using dairy beef um, and, and better practices with manure management and so on, which we could go into. But yeah, the size of the difference is usually very much underestimated. So, OK, then following on from this, because then there's an argument. So so that, OK, well, we need to try and change what the consumer would like to to to, to come along and, 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 and buy. And so then you got the people either making or selling the food. OK, and and in, in very many. And they says, well, we're only selling what people we're only making what people want to buy. So so how do we uh, um, get this? This is another instant. Incidentally, I'm not coming. Up, this is another audience question. I've been told to tell in, in this case. Um, but how do we then get get the food industry and, and persuade them to alter what they sell, what they make and what they sell? Well, I think we can look at other examples where the food industry has changed um, and has responded to public opinion. Uh, one really visible example in the last couple of years is plastics. 
So what we see now is the public opinion on plastic is driving food producers to change their packaging, driving supermarkets and governments to, to advertise their plastic uh, reduction policies for better or worse in terms of reasons sometimes, but the, the, the public are absolutely driving food producers to change. Um, but your example earlier about the, the BBC, uh, the, 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 the news item mm. um, about the government retracting quickly um, uh, association with wanting to, to predict, bring in policies. I want to see that same level of enthusiasm, public enthusiasm for climate policies that we've seen in terms of uh, plastics. You know, the people can demand changes in policy and that will make a difference but actually we need that information to reach a large number of people and people to demand that and that will that will do it we've seen it already um a question for Anne. Um, this is another another question that has that has come in um so we're talking about plastics but another touchstone shall we say whenever we talk about sustainability about, about the climate it's food miles everyone's my food miles and, and i've been told by my wife and so i'm now looking at the beans oh my god it's from peru i can't have beans now it's from peru so i guess the the the, the question is oh carrots from somewhere or oh, carrots are probably from here how, how do we shift it, it let's put it this way what is your view first of all on food miles okay that's that's, that's a just as a first question just your, your view about it and if we focus on food miles, is that helpful? Is it too simplistic? Right. First, first of all, um, my view on food miles is that you can transport foods across the globe fairly sustainably with few emissions. Depends how you do it. But if you ship strawberries from California in the middle of winter, then it's going to produce a lot more emissions and a lot more damaging. Um, the transport of food within the, the, the spectrum of emissions for food is only 4% of emissions. So it's not the most damaging, but it is something that people can get a, a grip on food miles, but it comes from a long way, so it must be wrong. And it's the same as packaging, which is only 5% um, of emissions. I'm taking notes. But it's easier to hold on to those things and have a conversation when it's something simple like that. But of course, it isn't simple. It's part of a much, much bigger picture. And as Sarah and Emma have talked about the importance of meat and the emissions from meat, it's not only the emissions from meat, it's the, the land use that goes with meat. So we've got to think about how our food is grown and what land it takes up. Um, meat takes up a lot more because of course you have to grow the crops to feed the animals. So that's part of the picture. Um, another part of the picture is the soil and how crops are grown. Um, again, touched on by Sarah and Emma in regenerative farming. If we can grow crops in a way and rear some livestock which fits into a better system, then the emissions will be reduced and our food will be more, our whole environment will be more sustainable. It will be there in the future for us rather than be having been um, used up and taken away. But how you get the conversation onto that is another matter. Um, I'm just from personal experience, I've been working on stalls and at events now for about seven or eight years. And when we first started getting some of this data out and people would suggest, you know, really, we've got to cut back on our meat. People would say, what? Cut back on meat? What are you talking about? We always eat meat. Um, it's the packaging, it's the, the food miles, that's the problem. And over the, those, seven years, now people are saying, I know I've got to reduce my meat. That's, that's what's going to make a difference. And I think the messages is, are getting across that this isn't a simplistic thing, um, that it is more complex. And I think people are understanding too, it's also about biodiversity, that our environment is an interrelated living um, being, if you like, we need to have healthy systems around us to maintain our own health. Um, 
So does that answer the question somewhat? It answers the question, some, it answers, it answers the question somewhat for me. Sorry, am I, hello, hello? Yeah, it's fine. So, so what is interesting is you say that, that, that the, the public or whoever, Joe public, Jane public are, are getting on board, at least some of them are getting on board mm. with the idea of trying to eat less meat. Clearly not the government, <gasps> that was political. <laughs> uh, clearly not the government based on the evidence that we've seen for, uh, um, via, via the BBC News website. Uh, J Jason, another, another comment that was actually made and okay, so we wanna try and change um, how people eat. And obviously the, the big issue is, you, you, you know, you don't necessarily eat in, in, in isolation from each other. Some people do, but you eat as a family. And one of the comments is children are fussy eaters. You know, they'll only eat the fish fingers and they'll only eat, you know, the, the, the chicken nuggets. That's it, that's it. They're, they're nuggetarians that I made that, I, I made that word up. So, so look, you as an educator and you clearly work with, work with kids. So, so how do you rebut that? Children are fussy eaters. Um, it, it reminds me of a, a conversation I had a couple of years ago with a parent who came into the school and said, um, uh, how did you get Louis to eat broccoli? He never eats broccoli at home. And the little boy just looked up at his mum and said, you never give me broccoli. <laughs> so he, he had never experienced that because maybe the parents didn't like broccoli or they didn't like fish or they didn't like um, a certain uh, food stuff. And so they don't cook it at home. And I think what we can do, and we've seen it, um, with uh, the work that we do with Taste Ed, which is based on the Safra method of uh, sensory food education, is getting children to explore food. Get that curiosity. Okay, so using your senses. You know, everything that we know in the world, we've, we've gathered every human from their own senses. And when children first start in the school, at our school here with the nursery at the age of three, we do a lot of work on the senses. And we base a lot of their changing of their palates, their experience with food, by focusing in on their senses and playing with food, describing it. Don't even eat it because that invasive thing that is lasting. There's no pressure for them to eat. There's no one of the mantras we have at taste is no one has to like, no one has to try. But looking at the um, the actual food stuff, the, the fruit and the vegetables, and comparing different ones, um, comparing different types of apples, your russets, your, your your red apples, your green apples. You know the different shapes. Of it, describing that, listening to food. You put some headphones on and you eat a strawberry and then you eat something like a celery. It, the, the noise in your head is incredible. And these children get fascinated by that. Smelling this is like food. eating at the fat duck. I've never eaten at the fat duck, but I understand <laughs> this is what happened. I'm not on that budget either, Giles. I haven't got that either. <laughs> um, but things like smelling the senses, we put them in little flower sifters and they smell cinnamon and they smell nutmeg and they smell citrus and they smell all those types of things. And you get loads of things with culture there. You know, a child from Sweden will have a completely different experience of smelling cinnamon than a child from maybe North Africa. That cultural aspect to it as well. And then you go on to, you know, the kind of, as I said, the smelling of the, 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 um, the food. And then finally, you, you look at things like the, the tasting of it and not saying, I want you to ingest that straight away, but kind of the licking of it. You want to first lick, lick it. But because they've gone through all of that process, They've done it with their friends. It's a fun um, um, exercise. We haven't got that emotional attachment that we have with our own children. It's a teacher that's doing this type of thing. You've got that kind of, not peer pressure, but, oh, my friend's trying that. I don't want to be left out. I'm going to have a go. Oh, my God, I've never tried that. That's fantastic. And so using food education, those kind of exploring your own palates, finding your likes and your dislikes, getting that into the core of your curriculum and using it as a pedagogical tool. At the moment, food within the national curriculum is used as a kind of, or it's a D&T session. It's about the skills that you've got. And there's a lot of thing about childhood obesity and, and, and you know, your kind of area of their job. But that's, we can do a little bit on that, but not a lot. But let's get that enjoyment of food there and that it used as a learning tool. Um, and you can change palates, you can change children's perceptions of food. And we've had that back from parents saying, what you're doing there, you're causing, we don't have those arguments at, at, at the dinner table now. You know, they're joyful experiences at our, um, and two, children do try things and they use these different techniques that we've been doing in school, we've been teaching them that. So yes, it can be done and I've seen it, I see it regularly here. 
I mean, I mean, it clearly, it, it clearly can be done just by taking culture in, in, into an example. Now, I appreciate that culture, you start a little bit younger, but you do start young. And just as, as a classic example, I study food, I, I study food intake, as, um, as, as, as I said, and there are going to be some people who, you know, who, who like their carbs more than, than protein or like their fat more or maybe have a sweet tooth. But what's interesting is from a cultural perspective, there is always there is going to be a genetic basis to preferring sweetie or fatty foods. There is. But the way that these foods manifest themselves are very culturally, uh, are, are very culturally um, um, ingrained. You know, so just carbs, for example, look, I'm, I'm East Asian, I'm Chinese, you know, so my carb of choice, and I don't want to paint myself into a stereotype, is rice, but it, it is rice, all right? And me and bread, meh. Whereas, uh, so, 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 and, and I think that is something that's actually quite good that we can actually try and, and train in, 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 in kids. And I love the fact that, you know, because part of the problem with studying something like obesity, which is, which is what I study, is you get involved too much, to my mind, in the nutritional world, on, on, on social media, what have you. And, and the moment we mention the word food, people fear it. And I think that is a problem. All kinds of food, healthy food, vegan food, vegetarian food, food. And people fear it, and 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 I think that's what we got to do. We got to learn to love our food and understand our food, our food more. That was editorial, uh, uh, incidentally. Um, actually, there's a question here from um, from Kevin. I, I will come to live questions in a bit, but I see that our panelists are being very diligent in answering the question. They're disappearing before I can even see them. This is good. Um, there, there's a question that that came in from from Kevin. So this is a question about fish. So we're told that eating fish, like salmon or mackerel, um, is good for us, certainly from a health perspective. From a sign, I can tell you that that is true. Oily fish. What is its environmental impact? So, and not only fish. Let's expand that a bit more. Okay. So, so, so when we're talking about fish, are there other types of food aside from ground-based ruminants? Okay, going munch, 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 munch. Is is there something to be said for eating fish, for eating eggs, for for for, for example? Does, who wants to answer that um, that question? Oh, Emma, you first, go. I can come in on fish. I think that's a really important question. And seafood as a category, it is so many different species. It's so many different production methods. It's kind of hunting and farming and, well, aquaculture. And so it's hard to generalize about seafood. Um, and also there's the issues with overfishing as well as uh, climate impacts of getting um, sort of seafood protein. A really good option in the UK is rope grown mussels. You can get those in most supermarkets. They're very delicious. You can feel like you're Belgian enjoying your mules feet. And because these are um, these are filter feeders, so they help keep the water clean. Um, unlike, for example, there are issues with salmon farms where they're getting fed often sort of anchovies or soy or you know, other fish and things, which can cause huge pollution and uh, sort of parasite problems affecting wild salmon. Um, unfortunately, salmon is delicious. Uh, rope grown mussels is a really good sustainable option for the UK. Um, a lot of kind of bivalves, so uh, seafood with this sort of two um, uh, shells that come together. So oysters, uh, manila clams. Unfortunately, scallops are ones worth avoiding in the UK because they're often done by sort of dredging. Uh, so nets dragged across the bottom of the seafloor, which is very destructive and um, higher emissions as well. But farmed mussels, um, that's sort of the my seafood of option. And it's got a lot of kind of bioavailable micronutrients as well. So that's a good option for health and sustainability. Okay. Uh, um, Sarah, did you have anything to add to that? Or, or, or Anne, I'll come to you. Oh, Anne, you go first. You go first. I was just going to add that for consumers, one way of um, checking whether the fish you're going to eat has been fished sustainably is to look for the blue tick, the MSC blue tick, which and it changes, changes from year to year, which fish are, um, are sustainable and the, the stocks are healthy. But for eating fish, that's one simple way of a consumer finding something which they know will will be more sustainable. Uh, Sarah? Yeah, great. And just to sort of, um, just to give the bigger picture on fish, I'm, I'm really looking forward to having some mussels actually soon. So <laughs> that, thanks to Emma's great suggestion there. Um, but uh, yeah, just to talk broadly about fish. So the emissions from caught fish, the, the, the contribution to climate change from caught fish is mostly from the diesel 
um, that's used in the ships that go and catch the fish. And so they have to power the ship and also there's processing on board refrigeration and so on to bring those fish back. So that's the majority of the climate impacts from caught fish. The majority of the climate impacts from aquaculture, so that's growing the fish in farms um, uh, in land, um, is it near, near the sea inland, but that is coming from um, feeding those fish, as Emma said. By complete, well, not, co not total coincidence, the greenhouse gas emissions from aquaculture fish are quite similar to those for chicken, because both are about feeding those animals and similar to that for egg, eggs actually as well. So we've got to feed those animals roughly on some of the same things there. Um, it turns out by complete coincidence that is also very similar to the emissions from caught fish. There's no reason why those numbers should be this similar, but, but they're all roughly in the same emissions category there. Um, I, I just wanted to add a related question, and this came in live. Oh my God, I found a live question I can answer. Thank you. Thank you for. Let me just see if I can get the name of the person. Um, Aiden B. A. You got an A there with an orange. And, and the question is this Should there be, is it possible? I'm going to expand the question. A. Should there be, and is it possible to have a carbon footprint? sign on the food we eat, much like the traffic light system at the moment for sugar, for fat and things like that. What are your views, first of all, on having that? And is it even possible given what we know at the moment? Who has an opinion on, on or uh, opinion? Who has something intelligent to say? <laughs> uh, 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 about Emma, Emma, you, you, you always have something intelligent to say. Tell me. Oh, well, sometimes. <laughs> uh, so carbon labeling, I have mixed views on this. I think mm -hmm. Um, transparent information is really important. I think people knowing more about it can help develop support for policies which might be effective. But we can see from the traffic light system with nutrition that we're, you're still having to swim upstream to try and eat healthily. We're still not eating enough fruit and veg. It's still difficult to have a healthy and cheap and not very time consuming diet in the UK. Yes, chickpeas are generally cheaper than chicken and that's brilliant, but they take a lot longer to prepare and have a lot more knowledge. So I worry that a traffic light labelling system for food would take quite a lot. We could do it. Um, it would take a, quite a lot of effort. It might be a good idea. But then to say, right, we've done what we need to do. No more policies. We've just given people the information. Healthy plant based foods are still quite difficult to find, still take a long time to prepare, are still more expensive than they should be. Um, that doesn't solve those problems. So I think um, we should be quite sceptical because information alone isn't enough to change these habitual behaviours. The I know I should get the train instead of the car when the ticket price is five times what it would cost to get in our little car and sort of drive somewhere, that's quite hard to go against. So information can help, but it's not sufficient. So we've got to be very cautious about that. And, and actually, we, we, we know this from the amount of nutritional information that you actually get. I mean, it, the essays, the whole essay is now in the back. I don't go shopping with my reading glasses. And so I'm there going, I, font zero, I'm going, I, I, I don't know how much fat is in this. I, I have no idea. And so I completely, I completely understand. Going, what? what? <laughs> I think also it's really open to getting misused. With nutritional information, you can, in theory, go and measure what's in that food. You can check the number of calories, like maybe not us as lay people, but that's quite easy for someone with expertise to do. You can't do that for the carbon footprint of food. You can't take it away and dissect it and work out what went into that. So we've had issues with cars um, having mislabeled saying, yes, we've got very low emissions. And there was, I think it was Volkswagen, do correct me, that kind of emissions um, scandal. And so, you know, what's to stop how would you regulate that? How would you make sure what, what is in it is, is inaccurate and that there's not um, uh, inaccurate information and that the kind of more powerful actors get to make their food look better? So can I have a um, follow-up question? Not necessarily. Oh, oh, Sarah, go. So you. you. Yeah, I'd, well, I'd like, I'd like, you know, I'd like to agree with lots of the the, the factual things that that you've um, both said, but disagree with your kind of conclusions from those um, facts. Uh, just to liven up a bit, not agree with everything. Um, no. So yeah, I mean, I think I totally agree. It's a necessary but not sufficient thing. Um, to do that labeling alone won't won't do it all but at the same time there are lots of good reasons why getting that information is essential not particularly because consumers are going to stand there for hours even more hours than we already have you know so much information but actually if we look at something like um uh sugar which you know maybe you can correct me on this uh, giles but my understanding is there that yes providing more information doesn't change behavior 
However, providing more information does change people's receptiveness to policy changes. And since that's exactly what we're saying is a problem at the moment, then this providing the information will make people see, OK, yeah, we do need to do something about this. So there's that. But I would also say, again, with sugar, when they change the, uh, the threshold between a yellow and an amber traffic light for sugar, then companies went away and reformulated to make sure they never went into that red category. So even though nobody knew about it, we're actually as a nation eating less sugar. So I think there's a lot we can do with that. And at the moment, with this, you know, the national food strategy said we're not going to recommend a meat tax because we think it is, you know, you know, it's not acceptable to the public. Well, you know, actually there are people doing regenerative agriculture who are doing great things who want to see that, that information being transmitted to the consumer. And just to just to do a blanket meat tax might not feel fair to them, but you might potentially at some point get them on board with a climate tax, which might be one of several different options for using that information to really make a systems change. Um, I've got a, a question here about um, cost, so so um, I th which I think is an important part part of the issue. So we're here. Look, by its very definition, certainly us on the panel here, we are uh, middle class people. I don't want to paint broad strokes, but I think we are. Um, and I just get the feeling <laughs> that the vast majority of the people attending here are also middle class. So wh wh what is your thought, what are your thoughts, pardon me, about the cost to the consumer of doing this? And I bring up something like ultra processed foods, for example, and I think you raised this and it's been doing the rounds. It's been doing, in fact, I've been interviewed uh, just a couple of times on ultra processed foods, uh, just 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 um, recently, in particular, from the health perspective, not from a not 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 from a, um, um, a climate health perspective, but a health perspective. So, what is the problem? Is this a, a perception that healthy food is more expensive? Because I think, oh no no no, I'm gonna let me ultra processed foods are certainly a very cheap source of of um, of, of calories. Okay, so my question is. How do we tackle either the perception that healthy food is more expensive, vegetables uh, are gonna be more expensive certainly to make in terms of time or cost. Um, let's start there, let, 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 let's start there because I think we've got to do this equitably. And are we in danger if we start taxing things and moving things around of actually shutting out a section of, a, a big section um, of society? Who, who would like to answer that question? Uh, Anne. I think it's your question has opened up a whole area of um, desperate need within our country. Um, food poverty is a reality for a lot of families and the thought of food costs going up is going to cause a lot of families a lot of distress. Now, as far as healthy food, for example, fresh vegetables is concerned, for a lot of families where they live, they live virtually in food deserts. They might have a corner shop and a big supermarket accessible by bus, but they haven't got the corner green, green grocer, they haven't got the local fishmonger, butcher, etc. So their choices are limited. Um, the cost is another issue, but I think the cost is as much as anything a perceived cost. I think a lot of people, are, a lot of skills have been lost over the past couple of generations in terms of shopping and cooking good food. And because there is so much ready-made processed food cheaply available, People have opted for that. I know families are busy and parents are busy. And if you've got a large family with, with children and they're coming and going, it's harder. But that whole cooking and sitting down and sharing a meal together has been lost in a lot of families. So there's that aspect of it. Um, what do we do about it? Um, and I don't this might be too big a question, to, but 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 I think it's important. You want me to go on and and make some suggestions for how it? I tell you what, before uh, before you come, come come to that, can I direct because I, I spotted a question up here which is which is actually um, related to this with regards to cooking skills, and this is a question from Denise Olga. Thank you for your question to Jason, and and the question is um, certainly within your school, 
and do you think this is valuable? In addition to the growing and, and, and what the strawberries, uh, uh, what are the elements of actually trying to get the kids to learn how to base, uh, basic level to cook? Do you think that would improve things? Very much so, very much so. Um, it, you know, for, for children to, to learn those basic skills, doing the claw method at, at cooking, um, at, of cutting things, we, we learned quite early on, you can buy these little gloves, the cut gloves that you see in, in professional kitchens. Use them if you're a teacher, please, with your children. They're cheap as chips. Um, and it, it takes that anxiety away from the teachers if you're using knives. To, um, teachers tend to say, well, they're going to cut themselves, but they won't with these types of um, things. But we do cooking and we link out with the themes that the children are, are learning about. Um, but the key to this, I think, is giving CPD professional development to teachers as well. So they are confident in that because it's not just the children that lack that confidence. As Anne was saying there, we've got a whole generation that don't have those key, um, those skills. You know, I go into the supermarket and I'm that sad person that takes photos of those prepared meals. You can get a chicken dinner in a pack, you just stick in the microwave. Now cooking now is, you know, currently is, is the sound of the microwave. You know, it's the ping of a the microwave. There's no sizzle, there's nothing with it. None of that. I think if we can give the teachers, and that's the biggest thing I learned when we first introduced um, the cooking 10, 12 years ago when I first started here. One, start off basic. Start off with um, recipes that teachers can do that there's no heat involved because teachers don't want to burn things. They don't want to embarrass themselves in front of um, uh, the, the children. So creating salads, creating meals that you don't have to um, add any heat to. Then they get the confidence. Then they teachers then... Uh, Give that confidence to the children. They are then not anxious about it. Then you can move into the things about where the leadership team needs to invest in this. They've got to get the resources there for the teachers to do. We have little induction holes that we, um, we, um, the teachers use, and they have big packs of things like sieves and graters um, and, and colanders. So there's no barrier to the children learning this skill. And needless to say, the children absolutely love this. Um, but it's also that key about, as Anne picked up there, the social aspect of food as well that we can sometimes miss out on. You know, the, the idea, I think you know, the term is commensality, of the social skills you get of gathering around and eating together. And it's never so important now, um, coming out of a pandemic, children having lockdown, that that improves their mental health as well. Just sitting around talking to their, their, their friends, having a meal together, cooking a meal together. There's so many aspects that not just the kind of basic skills of of cooking, but all those other things that feed from it as well. So following on from your question, Jason, once again, a, a you mentioned about you going and taking pictures of, um, yeah. uh, so, so, so like I do with of, of my food, I am one of those irritating Instagram people, but you do it at a supermarket, chicken. Uh, um, my, my question is, um, is, is this, with regards to vegetarian food and vegan food. Now I've had ultra processed vegetarian and vegan food. Now, I just did an interview about the healthiness of it, and we can talk about that. But I'm here talking about the climate health the, 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 to it, all right? Now, we have eating a steak, okay? And, and we, we understand that that sits on one end of the spectrum, and we have eating a carrot, okay? Where does, where does the ultra-processed um, vegan or vegetarian meal, one that Jason would take a picture of in a supermarket, where does that actually come in? Um, and I guess there are any number we can talk about. Let's spread this out and we can, we can de deal with this at a time we, there's some less processed than others. But then you have the real famous ones, you know, the faux meats, the bleeding burgers, the impossible burgers and beyond burgers of the world. So what, what, what are people's thoughts on, on, on that, away from steak and carrots? Yeah, I'll start off and I'll just get the, the, the experts to carry on with that. I, I have a, a, an issue with the disconnect that children have with food. The fact that they, they don't have this... I, we, we always ask our children whenever they came into to where, where does food come from? Years ago, you used to say, you know, children were saying, oh, I'll get my food from Tesco's, I'll get my food from, you know, Sainsbury's. You know, there, there, there's no farm aspect to it. We had a child um, about 18 months ago, a nursery child, saying, you know, where do you get your food from? My food comes from mummy's iPad. Because she sees mummy ordering the food on the iPad. So they're not even, that's where it comes from now. And so children don't get to feel food. They don't, you know, you go, as I go into those supermarkets, take a picture of, you can buy mashed potato. Children don't know how you get to that stage. They've never felt a potato. They've never felt the peely, papery skin of an onion. They don't know how to pick these things up. They don't know, you know, the, maybe what the inside of some of the, these vegetables um, look like. So um, I'm, 
you know, the processed food aspect, we don't have that at school. We're very, very strict on that. We want those fresh um, fruit and vegetables for the children because I think that's part of the healthy aspect that you want to, to, to bring into it. I don't want those um, ultra processed foods in there because, it, you know, there is that, that health aspect to the children as well. All right, experts. Uh, uh, Emma, first expert on the block. Oh, everyone here is an expert. Um, but I will push back. I, I will stick up for the sort of processed kind of meat alternatives. I think they're a really nice treat. I think they're a really good thing to have in the arsenal. I think health aspects I'm not an expert on. I've seen one study that suggested um, uh, short term it was better than, um, I think it was a beef burger, but I have to dig up that study. And I think we forget how much processing it takes to turn a cow into, into a burger. The, and I think the supply chain issues we've seen recently and you know, the 120,000 pigs getting cold on farm with huge financial and mental health deleterious kind of impacts like for those farmers. Because we don't have enough skilled butchers in the UK at the moment, because of the CO2 shortages from the gas prices from the fertilizer plants getting um, shut down. So yes, plant-based burgers are processed, but so are, so are beef burgers. If someone turned up um, to your house with a cow straight off the farm or some cabbages straight off the farm, one is a lot easier to prepare and cook than the other. And uh, so in terms of the carbon footprint, so corn, which is quite a famous meat um, alternative brand, they've done some carbon footprinting of their foods. And so uh, probably not quite as low as a carrot, uh, but still, um, still pretty good. If it's all right, I, might, I want to sort of jump back on the issues around kind of poverty and food poverty. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Discussion. And Jay Rayner, the food writer, had this great, he says that there's no such thing as food poverty, it's poverty. And I think that's worth really hanging on to. Mm. That, you know, poverty is the issue. We talk about food poverty like it's a special flavour, pardon the pun, poverty. But it's, it's, it's poverty, this is the issue. And I, I'm really struck by the percentage our income and food in the country has gone down over the last few decades and the percentage that we're spending on rent has gone way way up so I think there's a big kind of rebalancing I think I uh, this is obviously big policy levers but when you're talking about food this is what's happening that you want to um so spending less money on keeping ourselves housed and maybe a higher proportion of our income on keeping ourselves fed but so that everyone gets their basic needs met in terms of time and preparing meals, you know, I, I really enjoy cooking, but not when I'm stressed and short on time. And you know, several decades ago, for many people who were in you know, heterosexual relationship marriage, the man went out and worked and the woman stayed home and cooked. And now partly because you know, house prices have gone up, that you need both partners working to kind of you know, afford childcare, you know, afford a deposit on a house. So I think you know, in terms of, yes, we want these skills, but people need the time to be able to cook. And a lot of people don't have that. So things like a three or four day working week, free affordable childcare, these things all kind of interact with you know, being able to take our time and enjoy our food in a more social manner. Um, the, you sometimes see tweets from some politicians saying, oh, well, you know, potatoes cost less than a bag of frozen chips. It's like, yes one is much quicker and tastier to eat than the others in many ways so we need to think about the time cost of food as well as the financial cost and more time so for Anne, you 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 had you had um um uh, something which i rudely interrupted you that, that's all right um and it really is answering another question but um going on with with this I, I think there is a place for food which has been processed we after we eat cheese we eat um yogurt all of these things are processed and i think i think emma is right a lot of these things have a place in the the broad menu which we can give ourselves for food okay can i keep um, um stick with the uh it's sort of related. It's come through uh, um, um, here as well. What are the sort of related in terms of because it's almost sometimes it's privileged and I think there's a lot of hype about it and I just want to know how much hype. What role does organic uh, 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 food, vegetables, let's go with vegetables, uh, um, have in this in this climate uh, uh, debate? Anything at all? Because I, I can tell you for free that it has almost zero health uh, uh, benefits aside uh, um, in terms of organic being healthier for you. Uh, for that, but what, what what is your view in terms of from a carbon footprint um, perspective? 
Anne? I think from a carbon footprint perspective, it's that organic food is grown without artificial fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, etc. And the artificial fertilizers create an enormous carbon footprint when they're used on food. And the organic produce is much better for the soil because of that. And therefore the soils are healthier there's more biodiversity and they act as a carbon sink far more effectively than more conventional methods of agriculture. Sarah? Yeah, I mean, just to sort of summarise the, the research literature on, on that, you know, if you, it depends on whether you, as you say, you're looking at uh, meat or vegetable products. Um, so on average, it's it swings and roundabouts. Um, so meat products, Organic actually can cause more climate impacts than non-organic because the animals live in better conditions for longer, um, which is you know, often the biggest determinant of, of how much emissions they cause. Um, plants uh, tend to be slightly lower uh, for a lot of the reasons that Anna said, but yeah, it's, it's, it's in terms of the climate impacts the studies are showing, there's not a, an enormous difference. Okay. Anyone else have any, so, so I guess, it's because it's always, and I think that is my understanding as well, because people often say that, oh, organic food is healthier for you. I mean, I guess it's that there's less pesticides, and which is probably healthy, but in terms of nutrients, there is no real nutritional difference between, between an organic carrot and an actual carrot. But I did, I did understand that there was, um, um, a, 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 there was a, an environmental element to it, although I'm not an expert. So this is just, it's, it's, it's confirmed some of what, some of what I actually, um, what I actually knew. So now as far as question, let me just see what live questions um, that we actually have. Oh, okay. This is from Jyoti and I'm sorry if I've murdered your, your, your name. Um, palm oil. Uh, this is just, this is just as a, as, as a question here, folks. Um, I'm throwing it out there. Um, is there a, 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 is there such a thing as sustainable palm oil? Okay, we know, look, uh, uh, clearly you hacking down a jungle and clean, killing orangutans, you know, I, I, I can, but is there such a thing as sustainable palm oil? Uh, Emma? I can go for this one. So palm oil is really interesting. Um, and I think it's not as bad as many people think, or it's complicated. So the trouble is uh, palm oil is causing a lot of deforestation. Deforestation is not good. We want to be reforesting. So that is a real issue. That is a real threat. I would not kind of deny or want to minimize that. However, the good thing about palm oil is it's really high yielding. So this means you get a lot of oil for the amount of land that you're farming. And this is really good news. So you need less land needing to kind of meet our nutritional calorie needs and for oil. So unless you're saying no one should farm in the tropics, which would be a bizarre and very totalitarian <laughs> suggestion, palm oil is a really good option for farming in the tropics. Um, there are various certification schemes about palm oil. I don't know the details and pros and cons of those. I've seen some suggestion that, you know, beef farming in the tropics, which is an even bigger cause of deforestation than palm oil and getting a, a much smaller amount of food from that area of land. Shifting from beef pastures to palm oil, you know, would be quite good for the amount of calories you're getting from the land. Um, you're also palm oils, uh, palm oil is a, is a tree. So you do get some biodiversity kind of in those farming systems. So um, deforestation, bad, high yielding, good. And palm oil is really interesting in where it sits in both of those. Oh, thank you for that nuanced answer. Oh, Anne. Can I make a suggestion that palm oil is just one aspect of the global system, the whole food system. And it, it's, it's a result of the fact that the Western world has discovered that palm oil is brilliant in all sorts of things. It's, it's wonderful for use in certain foods. So the demand for it has gone up dramatically. And in order to meet that demand, so people have profited from cutting down forest to grow palm oil. And it's exactly the same with such things as avocados, for example. Avocados are lovely, they grow naturally in Peru and other South American countries. The Western world wants lots, so therefore the, the ground is degraded, the working conditions are poor to supply the Western world with avocados. And I think in all these things, we've got to look at the whole system and realize that resources are not infinite. 
And we have to make the best use of what resources can be sustainably managed and grown, rather than demanding that our needs are met for every whim and every fashion, food fashion fad, or even genuine uses, we have to accept as finite resources and make the most of those rather than um, despoiling the environment. So let, 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 me, let, me follow up, let me follow up on a related question there. And this is, um, you, you mentioned avocados and that famously, uh, as, as you said, it's grown, it's a fruit, it's, it's, it's there, but we have now taken and transported it all over the world. So, so there's a related thing which, which people often ask me about. Now, once again, from a health perspective, I have answers for you, and this has to do with plant-based milks, okay? So now, the couple of questions that I'm interested in, there's cow's milk, okay, the milk that we consider as milk. Um, what kind of impact that is, I think I'm going to get a general feel of an answer I'm going to get from you guys. But then we have a whole range of plant-based milk. We have soy milk. I'm Chinese. I've drunk soy milk all my life as an, off, as an offshoot of tofu, okay, uh, a tofu production. And then obviously you've got almond milks, and then you've got oat milks and quinoa milks and, 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 and that whole range. Now, I can answer the question with regards to health. But is there a ranking system that we have to put there in terms of a carbon or water footprint, same thing probably, uh, uh, but an environmental footprint on milks. And does dairy milk really sit at the, at the top of the chain of, of, of the carbon footprint, of the environmental footprint? Uh, Sarah. Yeah, I can, I can, I'm sure that yeah, there's got lots to say as well, but uh, yeah, in terms of dairy milks, then yeah, there's, there's very little overlap between the carbon footprints of dairy milks and the carbon footprints of plant-based milks. The dairy milks are, you know, are tw twice or more times higher in terms of their carbon footprints. In terms of ranking the plant-based milks, then, um, you know, it, it actually, it's not really so much about the raw ingredients because you've also, because they're relatively low impact, you also need to look at the packaging, the transportation, the processing. So depending on how those things are done, then, then you could have a lower number or a higher number, which is why you know I would come back to the issue of labelling, uh, because without that information, then we, we won't know the answer. But yeah, in principle, they can be, be, be much lower. Okay. Um, um, Emma, did you have any anything to? That's an interesting. Thank you for that answer, because I, would, my problem is actually listening to you, Sarah. Actually, listening to Anne as well about whole systems is I don't. Shocking, but I didn't actually really take that into account. And because people ask me health questions, I answer in a health fashion, which for me doesn't include the packaging. <laughs> it's, it's a, and so I never really, I should think, I should think um, um, uh, uh, more about that. So that is, and, and what, what, do pe what are people's feeling about soy? So since we're on the soy milk scenario, I mean, there is, for example, now you can buy pretty expensive uh, a chicken, for example, which says that they're soy-free chicken. So in other words, this is chicken which is allowed to, 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 to graze and be... So rather than being fed, fed soy, they're, they're allowed to be chickeny. i I'm not sure. Anyway, so, so, so but, but the, the argument is because they're not felt fed soy, that, they're, that there is a lower environmental impact. I, 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 know, I have nothing intelligent to say about this. What are people's uh, view about soy? I've eaten so, tofu all my life. Don't tell me I can't eat tofu. But, but, but what are people's view on this? Someone, well, Emma. Well, I'm lots of opinions. I think tofu, it can be a, a little soy. It's a little bit like palm oil in the discourse. I think it feels like a safe food for people in the UK to say that's awful because we don't grow it here. So there's not a risk of alienating um, British farmers. Um, soy is great. Again, deforestation, not good. Soy, fine. The idea that um, I think generally you have a higher soy footprint if you're eating the pig or chicken that the soy has come through rather than eating the delicious like tofu directly yourself. So soy milk is quite a good option. Um, oat milk is also, you can grow that in the UK if you're keen on that. You can grow soy, uh, I think a bit more in Southern Europe, but we can get local-ish soy on a continent perspective. Um, nuts do have quite a high water footprint. Um, I don't tend to sort of have um, nuts that I consider a treat rather than a staple um, for me for that reason. Whereas beans, um, legumes, and you know, soy is a, is a type of legume you know, are great for the soil, like, and your health, kind of, um, and the planet. So, yeah, enjoy, enjoy soy. Again, the deforestation, not good. <laughs> soy, good. Jason, you had your hand up? Oh, no, okay. Uh, uh, um, anyone else have any uh, 
Any, any, oh, Anne, go. Sorry, I'm looking, I'm doing things at a time. Anne. And this isn't about soy so much, but it's about feeding chickens. Okay, and yeah. Because the, the, the food that we feed chickens impacts on the eventual carbon footprint of the bird. Um, there's a very interesting exploratory uh, organisation in Cambridge or outside Cambridge, which is breeding maggots because chickens in their natural habitat love eating any grubs and things they find and making this available as a cheap way of producing food for the chickens. You have a little maggot farm <laughs> um, in a box and extract maggots at various intervals. So I think some there's, there's alternative ways we can think of to, to be more creative, perhaps, in how we approach finding alternatives. Um, we, we have um, chickens at our school. We have, we have um, a dozen chickens. They're a chicken per class. They're all named. And, uh, and um, the children go out and uh, they collect the eggs and everything. So that maggot thing, I can just see our key stage one children just going wild for that. You know, there's a win-win there. Who's not going to like that as a child, putting your hands in a bucket full of maggots and feeding chickens? Listen, I've just got the poke from from um, the, the, the various teams saying that we got to begin to think about um, I'm not wrapping up yet, not wrapping up yet. But we got one last question. It's a big one, and I'm hoping to um, to, to maybe hear from from all of you. Uh, this is from Georgia Nixon, and um, what are the big global hurdles for transitioning to a lower lower carbon diet? And this is obviously coming up to COP26. This is a question. What what are your, your views on the big hurdles? Um, um, to a low carbon diet, folks. I don't know who wants to go. I'm going to ask everybody. So who wants to go first? Anybody? Ever? Anne. I think the big global hurdles are the fact that the food system is controlled by a very small number of very large companies who have a vested interest in keeping things the way they are. And I think what we can do about that is to really start celebrating developing local food chains, local producers, valuing what we can produce locally and making sure that that food is accessible to all the people who live within that, that area. And that's, I think that's the only way we can get round the, the stranglehold that these bigger companies have on our, our food systems. And, 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 I and I presume why, sorry, something is feeding back here. And I presume, um, based on what you said, a key reason why that BBC article was, uh, uh, that, not BBC article, why that report was pulled down so quickly by the government, because presumably there's also powerful lobbyists uh, mm -hmm. uh, within, within those companies. Um, um, Emma or Sarah or Jason, who wants to go next about what you think the big hurdles are to transitioning to, to, to a low carbon? It doesn't have to be big. It can be just, what, what are your views? Anyone has a view to share? Uh, Jason? Uh, this isn't going to surprise you what I say. It, the key to this is education. We talked at the very beginning here, you know, Sarah was talking about, you know, the, the, the impact of people and the demands that people have. If you're going to bring the next generation of people that will have that impact on, on the carbon uh, issue of food, then they need to know about it, they need to be aware about it. You know, schools aren't just there for the academic results. They're not there just to teach a frontal of verbials and time tables. You know, that's important. But we've got a crisis. We can't, you know, coming up. We've got COP26. Hopefully, you know, these, these, these leaders will, will, will show us the way to come. But you can get it in schools. And these children absolutely love learning about food. If you make it a whole school food issue and you bring in those sustainability issues into it, all of a sudden these blood bags come on saying, well, I can make a difference here. And if they think that, and it's in national curriculums across the world, you know, the UN now, you know, the, um, the farming and agricultural organisation are seeing this. They're seeing the power of food education. Get the children thinking about this, talking about this, then you'll have the, the impact of it because they'll demand it. That's, a, that's, that's excellent. You know, what the Whitney Houston song? Children of the future. Sarah. Michael Jackson, I think, Giles, there. I don't want to correct you on that one. But we're both of 80s things, so yeah, sorry. 
Well, be boring and just totally agree with everything Jason <laughs> just said um I, yeah I couldn't agree with you more that you know information and public awareness is a way out of this and I think it's nowadays for, for kids to come out of school without knowing about the climate impacts of their food is 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 just not in my mind acceptable and I think the national food strategy uh, didn't go far enough uh, on this you know it's got fantastic stuff about uh, more taste ed stuff and you know sensitizing school, uh, kids to different foods but i want to see across the board education on the climate impacts of food as you say in the national curriculum and you know this is this is this is the way that we're going to drive the the change that you know we we need i would also point out though that you mentioned a bit, a bit about the minority in this middle class issue minorities can drive change it's not the whole of the UK public which is demanding uh, a change in plastic use. It's not the whole of the UK public demanding more plant-based options. And yet supermarkets and, and food producers are changing. So I think that, you know, we need, we need kids, but we also need the public. And even if it is, you know, the minority of the public who are interested in environmental issues, this can still make a difference. Quick, quick question, um, um, Sarah, because I know that uh, just just looking back at the introduction I, I, I gave you, you know, with regards to the to your book, I mean, do you think that would be a useful? Re you know, t t tell us about, you know, would it be a useful resource, you know, in terms of uh, in terms of calculating one's carbon footprint, calculating, thinking about things more holistically? Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, that's why I wrote it was because I want to get this information out there. Um, but we do lots of other things um, and there's lots of other ways we can do it. One of the things I love is these flashcards, which you can download from our website for free if you want to. You can even sell them if you want to. We, they're public accessible, converting the equivalent amount of greenhouse gas emissions into the equivalent number of minutes oh. driving a car, for example. So you know, there's lots of free resources out there. Um, my book is a free ebook if people are interested in that as well, thanks to funding from the University of Manchester. But you know, there's 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 a lot of information out there and, and fun worksheets, um, for example, that we've put on our website, which would be great, which we've used in schools. Uh, Emma. Right, because I, well, I've spent so much of this evening agreeing with the other panellists, I will now slightly disagree to <laughs> add in a bit of uh, debate. Um, what is the, what are the limiting factors for more sustainable food systems, COP26? I think political will. And I've just released a paper with a couple of authors and we talk about we need to be very careful of like corporate's influence in policy making. We've seen it with um, ExxonMobil, the fossil fuel company, um, influencing US legislation. We absolutely need to be skeptical of this. Young school children have been campaigning, asking for climate action for you know three years and counting. They know. So I'm not just the kids that need educating. I think it's the kids that need persuading. Um, I'm all for more education, but it is not a magic bullet. I think it's creating kind of creating power, and so that the politicians are kind of compelled to act because the because there's not an option not to so I think that is really really key um and I'm all for children leaving school being able to cook um I would say like a chickpea curry and a black bean chili that would be great but uh political will and then I think secondly local food systems it's worth remembering every environmentally damaging activity is local to somewhere so local in itself doesn't mean environmentally sustainable so, you know, in Cambridgeshire, we have some incredible farmland. Some of it is very, very rich in peat. That is producing huge volumes of CO2 emissions, unfortunately. Like, this is really unfortunate. It's very local. That doesn't automatically make it um, sustainable. And I think also, although I'm, you know, pro-reducing food miles where we can, and where that's appropriate, but actually having, being able to trade food is probably quite useful in mitigating famine it's like we've had harvest failure in this part of the country or this region but we can still um ship and exchange food so yeah political political will i think is the, the big barrier we've got to find some and deliver it to number 10. so so um i'll and i'll uh, uh close with just some of my thoughts about this I, i'll draw an analogy and i don't know if it's a perfect one but um from a health perspective um, some people have always asked me, oh, oh, what would I do if I were PM for if I if I were the if I were the uh, uh, I don't have enough hair. I don't have a lot of things. But anyway, so so PM for the day, what would I do in terms of for healthy eating? How how would I in, try and solve the obesity problem and diet related illness? And my answer always is, naively or not, is that we should subsidize healthy food, not only the carrots, 
but actually foods that are healthier for you. So that when Mrs. Smith, who has two minimum wage jobs and needs to feed her kids, is forced to buy the cheaper item, it is always the healthier item. Okay? This is not happening yet. Okay? This is, this is my answer. And I'm just wondering if that has just got to be the way equitably, where if there is a way of actually accurately counting the carbon miles of whatever it is you're eating, Okay, and th this is going to come because obviously meat is going to have higher than, than, than carrots, as we've discussed, that if we subsidize lower carbon food in some, if we're serious about this, if, if we are serious about trying to save our planet, I hope we are, whether or not we should use, do that, we should be subsidize, subsidizing lower carbon foods um, so that when Mrs. Smith goes to the gro grocery store, she will automatically not only be buying the healthier food, but also the lower, but also the lower carbon food. But that may sound a little bit like uh, Nirvana. Um, so, folks, our time is up. Um, I want to uh, thank our wonderful panelists, uh, Sarah Bridal, um, Anne Mitchell, Emma Garnett, and Jason O'Rourke. Uh, thank you guys so much to be here. Please remember that um, Cambridge Zero Climate Change Festival, ladies and gentlemen. And for those of you who want to go back and listen to any thoughts. Um, you can actually get it. Where can you get it? Uh, you, you'll be sent um, a link about where to actually get the get get the recording. Um, please do let us know what you think of the event. Please um, visit the Cambridge Sustainable uh, Food um, .org website to actually find out more information. Um, aside from that, everyone, go think low carbon and healthy thoughts. Um, it's been a pleasure to to do this. I have learned lots. I hope you have too. Um, thank you, everybody, and um, have a great evening. Thank you so much, guys.